Hey there, awesome physics students. Let's talk about impulse and the connection between force time graphs. So first, let's start out with a simple uh, one-dimensional situation here, just to keep it simple. And uh, let's think about what the definition of the impulse is. That is the net force acting on an object times the time interval over which that force acts. And when you compute that, that's going to give you the change in momentum of the object over that time interval. Remember that most of the thing that's changing in here is the velocity. So let's think about a situation where you're kicking a ball. Um, and let's say you kick, a, you kick a soccer ball and you somehow figure out a way to attach force sensors to the soccer ball so it can sense that the force that your foot is putting on the ball. What does that look like, that graph? Well, before your foot touches it, the force is zero. And then your foot comes into contact and the ball begins to deform. And as it, as it does so, it, it, the force rapidly increases. And then as your, force, your foot begins to lose contact with the ball, as it travels away, the force uh, decreases back down to zero. So you'll notice that the force here is changing. It's a variable force. Well, how do you get a changing variable force into this equation? There's just one value here. Well, you don't put this variable force in there. What you do instead is you mark off the place where the, the force begins and where it ends, and that's the time interval over which the force acts. And then you replace, for the one value you put in here, you, you find the average force. So this is the average force here. And you take that, and that's the value that you put up in this equation here. And the connection, the level of this average force has to be just right so that if you find the area underneath this curve here, the real curve, that area has to be the same as the area inside this rectangle here. Well, the area inside the rectangle is going to be the, uh, the height of this rectangle. That's just the average force times the width of this rectangle, that's the time interval. Well, now it looks exactly like what we had before. And so that's our goal. So what is the application of this? Or how can, how can we think about these forced time graphs on another realistic scenario? Well, let's think about a crash test dummy. And we'll think about two different scenarios with a crash test dummy. In, both, in one scenario, uh, the crash test dummy is uh, 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 crashing with an airbag. And so what happens with the airbag is the airbag inflat, inflates rap, rapidly and the crash test dummy's face comes, presses against the airbag and the airbag stretches the time interval over which the force acts. So it's a very long time interval which makes the force a lot lower. Um, if instead the crash test dummy gets no airbag, uh, what does that force look like? Well the force, as soon as they strike, the crash test dummy's head, in this case, will hit the windshield. And the windshield doesn't deform very much. And so the time interval over which the force acts is really, really short. And so uh, the force, of course, is going to be huge in comparison. And that's why we like to use airbags, is because the force is a lot lower with an airbag. And so the damage to our body is going to be significantly less. Now. The key thing to remember here is that the air for the dummy's head in both scenarios, it was going 30 miles an hour before, and then it came to a stop. So the change in momentum is the same in both cases. Since it's the same change in momentum, uh, what does that mean graphically? Graphically, it means the area here is going to be the same as the area here. Okay, because it's the same change in momentum, all right?